<clears throat> Good morning. Welcome to Bible study. We're continuing on with the book of Genesis, uh, doing Abraham more, we're going through the story of Abraham. Uh, and like I've been saying, uh, we're going from like that first chunk of Genesis where it's on creation for the most part. There's still some, of course, redemption, other themes in there, but the big focus is creation. Uh, now we're on the this other part of Genesis, which is all about the patriarchs. And the bigger focus is on redemption, how God is going to save his people. He's going to save the world, save you and me. And so we're going to keep on moving through there. This week, we will be going through uh, some of these fights and, and warfare that go on in the, in the ancient Near East and what Abraham and Lot, what their part in those fights were, as well as this person named Mel Melchizedek. And he, he's an interesting figure. We'll get more into him. He's an early like a uh, prototype or an early like example of who Jesus kind of will be. And so like Jesus, of course, is greater and everything, but like he's kind of like this early like example and like like his life as an example is like the prophecy about Jesus. So it's called a type, a religious type. We'll get into that more when we get towards the end of chapter 14. And uh, we'll get into some of the prophecies and some of the explanations in the New Testament that, that revolve around this guy, Melchizedek. He's an interesting figure, uh, partially because this is the only place where he actually comes up in the narrative, like in the historical sections of scripture. And then after that, he shows up like in, in the Psalms, in uh, in Hebrews. And so it's ex explaining things about him, but this is really the only section where we actually get the hard information about him. He kind of shows up and leaves. That's something even the author of Hebrews points out. Um, but let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, yes, uh, thank you for your love for us, that you are our prophet, priest, and king, that you as our high priest, you daily, um, you always bring our prayers before the Father in heaven. So thank you for that. Thank you for the love that you've shown us in your death and resurrection, that we are saved from our sins, we are forgiven, that we will live forever. Continue to guide us, remind us that your promises, that uh, you call us to trust in you and your promises in your word. And in that trust, you credit to us righteousness, just like Abraham um, way back here in Genesis 15. Uh, so guide us, uh, let your word fill us with hope and faith, and guide us each and every day. We ask this your name, Jesus. Amen. So let's open up to Genesis chapter 14. So a lot of name, a lot of names here, uh, a lot of names that uh, if you haven't read through Genesis in a little while, they're, they're names that it's easy to kind of forget these guys. They, once again, they really only show up in this chapter. Um, so uh, and there's a big, big list of them. So I'll go ahead and uh, read this first paragraph. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Ketoleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, these kings made war with Barak, king of Saddam, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shanab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Ketoleomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Ketoleomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Hanaim, the Zazim in Ham, the Amim in Shava, Karathaim, and the Horites in the hill country of Ser, as far as Al Paran on the border of the wilderness. And they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh. And defeated all, uh, defeated all the country of the. Uh, I almost got all through this. <laughs> um, that'd be the Amalekites, and also the Amorites were dwelling in Hazazan Tamar. Uh, so yeah, good chunk of names in there. But um, there's two groups of kings. So you have the one group led by Ketoleomer, and then the other group led by the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. So geographically. Uh, to split these two groups up, the one group, um, Ketoleomer, and his allies are from the north and the east, specifically Mesopotamia. So these are the kings of Mesopotamia, and they essentially ruled um, all the land. And, and so they would have ruled even the area down in the Dead Sea. So like you, Mesopotamia specifically is like that northern part of the Fertile Crescent. So like Syria, um, maybe as far south as Jordan, but I mean, it, depending on how broadly you want to say it, it's the entire crescent itself. So Israel, even down into Egypt in some cases, and then over into Iraq, and then the Tigris and Euphrates down into the Persian Gulf, so that big crescent um, there. And so these kings that are um, declaring war are coming from the north, and they have these vassal states uh, surrounding the Dead Sea. So the Salt Sea, we should know that as the Dead Sea, uh, so if you've ever been there or heard about the Dead Sea, you know, it's like it's, it's got the most salt uh, content in any uh, lake or sea in the world. 
and like you can even float very easily there because it's all salt. Uh, it's, you can't really drink out of that sea at all because it's just pure salt. Um, and so you have these nations around the Dead Sea that were vassal states to Ketoleomer. And so they're serving him, like it says, but in the 13th year, they rebel. So it doesn't give a reason as to why they rebel, but they do that. So maybe it was tax, most likely taxes, or they thought, well, we have a big enough coalition. Uh, we can rule for ourselves. Let's make ourselves our own kingdom here. And so they go on, they fight each other. So they rebel. And so Ketoleomer uh, and, and the kings are with them. They go down and then they... Um, and defeated the, these people um, in in this uh, in these areas, and so um, they they go and they're and they're making victory. So they have victory after victory uh, as they conquest down into uh, the the uh, the Valley of Sidim, meaning the the Valley of the Jordan and, and the Dead Sea. So you can get this idea. They're coming from the northeast and they're going south southwest as they curve around the Fertile Crescent into this area, into this river valley, and they're successful in their warfare. So for whatever reason, these people rebelled. Uh, they they weren't successful in the rebellion. So uh, the next paragraph. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with Ketoleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arya, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Then the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Saddam and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled into the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions and went their way. Uh, so uh, like I just said, uh, the northern kings end up succeeding and winning over these uh, southern kings. And, um, and so they flee. So kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. So that means not just like the kings literally, but also their armies. So it means their armies are defeated to such a degree where they retreat and scatter and go all over the place. And they flee off into the hill country. So they go all over. And then the enemy, meaning Ketoleomer um, and his forces, they take possession of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions. Uh, so that means they're going to take possession of the land. Uh, they're also going to take possession of everything that is in the land. And so we oftentimes think of like the spoils of war, like, like all the jewelry, um, the animals. Uh, but in these days, it's also people. And so they are claiming people, men and women. Um, usually that this is what causes slavery in those days. Your people get conquered uh, and you're marched off into some kind of slavery. Um, and this appears to be what has happened with Lot. So, um, so Abram's nephew. Lot is here. So uh, last week we talked about how Lot, he goes and he settles in Sodom. And so he's there, and now this warfare happens, and he gets caught up in that. And because he's dwelling too close to Sodom, he must have been near where the warfare took place. And so what oftentimes happens, even if you're not like, he's not officially part of Sodom's army, he, he's still going to get captured because it doesn't, because in those days, it's we've got the power, we've got the military strength, we're just going to roll through and take what we want. And, and that's what happened here. So Lot gets taken, meaning not just Lot, um, but Lot and his possessions, so a lot and everything. So it'd be his, his family, but also all of his people. So like last week, we talked about how rich Abraham and Lot were. They had lots of herdsmen. So they themselves were uh, maybe not kings, but they're clan leaders. Where they have a lot of people under them. And so they're going to lose in this warfare, or they're going to maybe not put up much of a fight. And then basically Sodom, or um, Ketoleomer comes in, conquers Sodom. And so now they are part of this prop, part of this territory, and now they are essentially his property. And so they go and they take him and take the rest of um, all of his possessions. And so now he is kidnapped and captured and being led away. Uh, so in verse 13, Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eskel and of Aner. They are allies of Abram. When Abram heard that, the kin, that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions, and they also brought back his kinsmen, Lot, with his possessions, and the women and the people. So someone escapes, and they go tell Abram. Uh, interesting note here, Abram the Hebrew. This is the first time someone is called Hebrew. Uh, a few weeks ago, when we were going through the genealogies, I mentioned Eber. He's kind of the father of the Hebrews. So that name is literally where the name Hebrew comes from. Uh, so um, that, that's where the, like, the etym uh, etymology comes from. So this is the first time someone's actually labeled as Hebrew because we always refer to him as Father Abraham. So like 
even though technically he's the son of, or like, I can't remember how many generations removed from ever he was, but he's several generations removed from ever. Um, we don't really focus on him. We focus on Abraham because he's the one that was given the promises of God and really is like the ultimate patriarch of the people of Israel. But he himself already has the designation of Hebrew because he's descended from ever. So this is the first time we see that designation here. Um, and so he is the Hebrew and he's living by the Oaks of Mamre. So that that's out um, in like central Israel. So I imagine that these forces that came from the north, they, they probably didn't pass too much through Abraham's land. And I imagine they are more on the eastern side of the river versus the western side where Abram and the Canaanites were. Uh, so, um, But they could have come through the west as well. As it even says, they came up through Dan. Um, so Dan's in northern Israel. So they are coming on either side of the river, um, but um, they are coming up as far as Dan. And then they, um, so they went in pursuit there. And then they even go as far north as or north of Damascus. And so um, Damascus, that's still around today in Syria. That's northeast of Israel. I was just curious how long Damascus has been around for. It's stated that it's believed to be the oldest capital city in the world. And so Damascus has been a pretty big city for a very long time. Um, inhabited, I mean, we have solid evidence to the second millennium BC, so 2000 BC. But I mean, some of these records possible evidence goes back to 5000 bc i mean damascus is one of those very 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 old cities if not one of the oldest cities in the world so when we're talking about some of these places that we go oh i recognize that name um yeah it's, it's that same city it's been around for a ridiculously long time and so you can tell us the cradle civilization and some of these places um even though they may have been completely flattened and destroyed in warfare over and over again uh, people keep building um, settlements and cities on these same places just because they are decently defensible. And so, like, you know, yeah, they lose the fight. It's usually very difficult to lose that. Now, Damascus, I don't know how much warfare they lost. Um, Damascus has always kind of been around. But um, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how old some of these cities are. So, um, but anyway, uh, they uh, Abram, he's successful with his, um, with his house. So 318 of his trained men. So you get the idea of how large Abram's house was. I mean, that's 300 people, 300 men he's leading into battle. And that uh, they're, so they're successful um, to, of bringing back Lot and his possessions and the women and the people. So they make a point. All the people are saved. They get all his possessions as well. And so they save Lot um, from um, these evil, from these um, um, opposing forces. Uh, so then verse 17. After his defeat from the, after his return from the defeat of Kedoliomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet uh, to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, "Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand." And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eskel, and Mamre take their share. Uh, so we have Melchizedek, king of Salem. So here he's, he's a king of this land. Um, and, but he's also priest of God most high. So he's priest of the one true God and he blesses Abram. And so blessed be God, uh, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. So he gives him this blessing and Abram responds by giving him a tithe. He gives him a 10th of everything. Um, and so this is where um, part of this um, tradition of the tithe comes from. That, that's where we get it from the Old Testament. Um, and so this is kind of where that's coming out of. And so he gives Melchizedek a tithe of everything. Um, and then the king of Sodom is there. So he's defeated, but he shows up again here in this valley of the kings. Um, and, and so he says, Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. And so he, he's trying to make a deal with him here. Um, but it's kind of a one-sided deal because Abram, he won. And so um, he, he gets to take the goods here and namely take his, back his family and save them. Um, and so he's saying, no, I'm not going to um, take anything that is yours uh, lest you should say I've made Abram rich. And so even if a Sodom wants to give him more things, he says, no, um, I don't want to take anything from you because I don't want to be beholden to you. Because uh, that, that statement, I have made Abram rich, um, that's incurring a sort of agreement um, where he gets to hold that over Abram because it's basically saying, well, I gave you this stuff. 
when are you going to give me something in return? So he doesn't want to be beholden to this guy. And so he says, I'm going to take nothing from you except what's basically already gone. So um, what happens is, I mean, the army rolls through, they defeat, you've been fighting all day, you're going to be hungry. And so they go and they eat what spoils are available to them. And so, yes, technically they're taking that. And so Abram's point is that's all I'm going to take from you. It's just what my young men have already eaten. So they've already eaten this stuff. It's already gone. So it's used up by them. So I'll take that, but that's all I'm taking. That way you can't say I've made Abram rich. And so um, I'm going to take that and that that's it and nothing more. And then I'm going to leave. However, let these other people allied with me, they may take their share. They're not at their allies, but not completely affiliated with me. They can make their own choices as far as how they want to have this relationship with Sodom. Um, so that, that's what's going on here. He's trying to not be beholden to this other nation. He wants to only um, praise God for the victory that he has done. Because it's because of God and his strength that they are able to save Lot and his family. Um, so th that that's that that's the deal here that's going on. And, and so this is the first interaction we have between Abram and Sodom. Um, we'll get more of this later with once again Sodom and Gomorrah with, with the whole um, pillars of the whole fire and, and the pillar of salt and all that. Um, but I want to turn back to Melchizedek. I kind of jumped over him because I wanted to cover the rest of this. Uh, this is the only place in narrative history that Melchizedek shows up. He will his name will show up and his person shows up in other places in scripture. Um, but it's always something is being explained about him, whereas this is the only place where he actually like shows up concretely. Um, so he's Melchizedek, king of Salem. And we'll get into Hebrews 7 in a moment where it'll explain this, but I'll explain it now. Melchizedek, his name, uh, Melchi is king of, Sedek is righteousness. So that's king of righteousness. So that's what his name translates to. But he's also king of Salem. And what's interesting about that is that's those are the same consonants as Shalom, uh, which is the word for peace. So he's king of righteousness and king of peace. Um, and he brings out bread and wine. And he's the priest of the God Most High. So he's a king and he's a priest. And he also is speaking a blessing for Abram on, account, on behalf of God. And so in that sense, he's also a prophet because he's speaking God's word on behalf of God. So here we have a prophet, a priest, and a king. And so you should be thinking Jesus here. Um, and, and because he is, Jesus is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. And even with the bread and the wine, that, that's, I just find that very, very interesting how like prophetic this, this story is here and what this is really talking about with Jesus. Um, cause like there's so many layers going on here where like the bread and the wine, that's kind of just something extra, but even that has, um, overtones and undertones of, prophecy of what Jesus will do in the Lord's Supper. Um, but the big per the big point here is the person of Melchizedek and what other authors what what other authors do with him uh, being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, so prophet, priest, and king, he blesses Abram. Abram gives him a tenth of everything. And so you get this idea that there's a relationship here um, and that he is a priest of the God Most High. So um, first, let's go to, stay in the Old Testament, let's go to Psalm 110. Um, I'll go ahead and read Psalm 110. Um, this psalm, before I read it, I want to note, this is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. So when they're establishing Jesus's authority or they're establishing like prophecy, who Jesus is, this is the most quoted passage in the Old Testament. Um, so in the New Testament. So um, when, they're, when they're talking about Jesus, this is the one that comes up the most. So I'll go ahead and read Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. And holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So this is the most quoted um, Old Testament prophecy about Jesus. Um, first, uh, a lot of the quotations come in the first verse. Uh, the Lord says to my Lord. And so this is coming out of pre Peter's sermon on Pentecost. Um, and so um, if, you, if you're reading out of um, at most, most English translations, it'll say the Lord says to my Lord. 
uh, you'll see the first Lord is capitalized. The second Lord is, uh, well, uh, uppercase Lord, but then lowercase other letters, whereas the first one, it's all uppercase. Uh, so when you see an uppercase Lord like that, that's the name of God. That's Yahweh. So that's the name that God gives to his people, uh, translating to he is, I am who I am. So that's Yahweh. That's his name. So Yahweh says to my Lord, um, that is the Hebrew word Adonai. Uh, so sometimes you might hear that word Adonai. If you ever um, talk to someone who's Jewish, uh, they, they, um, they, out of respect for not wanting to break the second commandment, uh, they will never say the name Yahweh. They will only say Adonai in place of that. Um, but that word, it, it's just like it says in the English here, translates to my Lord. So Adon, Lord, Nai, uh, my. So Adonai, my Lord. Um, but um, what, what the New Testament authors do with this verse here is they point out the odd arrangement here because this is a Psalm of David. This is King David writing. Um, and it's he's saying, Yahweh says to my Lord, meaning David's Lord. And the big question is, well, who is Lord over David that isn't God, that is a human? Um, and so this is getting into all these incarnation points in theology where Jesus is true God, true man. Uh, and so really this is pointing to Christ here because there's only one who can be Lord over David, uh, but also could have a conversation with Yahweh. Uh, and so that would be Jesus. And so it's kind of a big question mark where before Jesus comes along, um, who is this person that David is speaking of? Who, who are they? Um, and, and so we, of course, living in New Testament times, know that this is Jesus. So because like who can be Lord over David? Um, and it can only be the Son of God, Jesus. A lot of warfare imagery. I mean, this is all about warfare going through here. So it's reminiscent of both David's lifetime, of God helping him in his trials and his fights, his warfare, but also bringing up Melchizedek. This is going back um, to Abram's time. He, God helped him there in those difficult days as well, for, um, saving Lot um, from, these, from these foreign kings. And then we get to verse 4, um, that the Lord has sworn he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we get Melchizedek's name coming up here, and this is another reminder of, of the mult of the different offices of Jesus, where he's prophet, priest, and king. So here we're talking about the kingship of Jesus, but then we bring up Melchizedek and how he is also a priest, and so we get these multi-layered offices of Jesus as well. So the, David is speaking prophetically here of someone uh, who is going to be both a king and a priest. And so there's only one that really fits that description, and that is Jesus. Uh, so like Melchizedek, he's unique because he's both um, king and priest. And so likewise, Jesus is both king and priest. Um, so we get these um, these explanations, the, these prophecies here. Uh, it's, it's important to note as well that like in Israel, this idea of someone being a um, king and a priest isn't really possible because the priesthood, they're descended from Levi. So Le the Levites were the priestly clan. So like Aaron is a Levite. Moses is also a Levite, um, but um, they're descendant from Aaron. And so who are the priests? Well, they're descendants of Aaron. They're in the house of Levi. Um, uh, David is anointed king over Israel. He is descendant from Judah. And so we're, we're, we're talking about different branches of the same family tree here. So this is way down the line from Abram and Jacob. Um, but um, you get the idea, though, that you can't be a priest and, or, and a king in Israel um, because of these separate lineages. Um, so there's got to be something special going on here to have someone be a prophet, priest, and king. And so how does Jesus fit that? Well, he's descendant from the kings of old, from the king, from king David, from the kings of Israel. Um, but also he offers himself up as a sacrifice. So he... he he both offers himself, um, so he, he's the one offering the sacrifice, but he is the sacrifice. Um, and so in that way, he is also high priest. And then also um, now, the, there's also the, the emphasis on the now that he offers up prayers um, for us before the Father. And so he still is acting as priest even now. Um, so he is, um, after the order of Melchizedek, in that sense where he is both priest and king, something that really shouldn't be possible for the people of Israel, but because of Jesus' unique statuses, what he's done, who he is, he's able to fulfill that. So there's a lot of different um, takes that, like, this, this, gets, this gets used a lot in the New Testament just because that first line says a lot about the incarnation, because you get the idea God is talking to this person um, who is David's Lord. And so, like, that, 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 like, trying to figure out who that could possibly be 
basically leaves you at Jesus. He's the only one that can actually be David's Lord because he's God in the flesh. Uh, he's true God, true man. Um, and so he's the second person in the Trinity. And so this, this both explains a bit about the Trinity and also explains a bit about the incarnation. It explains how he's related to David and then Melchizedek here later in verse four. Um, let's go on then to where Melchizedek gets talked about a lot in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter seven. <clears throat> let's see. Um, so if you where I'm, I chose, there's a lot, a lot I want to read in Hebrews seven, you go back to chapter six, right? Verse 13, you'll see them mentioning Abraham. So it's bringing up this story we just read in Genesis 14. Um, and that um, verse 20 ends with where Jesus has gone on as a forerunner on our behalf, become, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So there they're directly citing Psalm 110. And so now uh, the author of Hebrews uh, is going to go and explain what that means for Jesus to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Excuse me. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham, a portion, a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was of whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is from their brothers though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not um, who does not have his dis descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond a dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One may even say that Levi himself who receives tithes paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Uh, so this first part, it's on the relationship of, of, of who Melchizedek is um, and who he is to other people. And so what's interesting about Melchizedek um, is, like I said before, he's the king of righteousness, the king of peace. And so you should be seeing those similar themes with Jesus. He is our king of righteousness. He won us righteousness by dying on the cross and rising. He's also the king of peace. He wins peace. Uh, he, he will establish peace on the world. Uh, but then he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Interesting point about Melchizedek. We've been going through these genealogies, but he does not show up anywhere in those genealogies. Now, the author of Hebrews knows he's a, he's a human being. He had a father and a mother. But his point is, though, is that's not recorded. Uh, nowhere is it recorded who his parents are, where this guy comes from. He shows up in Genesis 14 and then exits. So he's there for that one paragraph, and that's that. Um, so in that sense, though, he doesn't have a genealogy. He, we don't know when he begins or when he ends. And likewise, also is a type, is an example of Jesus because Jesus, he's the son of God. Um, yes, he has his mother, Mary, um, but he's also, because he's son of God, he is eternal. Um, and so in that sense, he has neither father or mother. And so in that way, um, he all this guy, Melchizedek, teaches us something more about Jesus. And so there's so many different ways that this person teaches us about Jesus. Um, and so see how great this man was. Uh, Abraham gives him a tenth of the spoils. Uh, and so he points out how the descendants of Levi, the priests, part of the Mosaic law is to give um, the Old Testament priests a tenth of what you have to take tithes from the people um, that are descended from Abraham. Um, but this man who does not have his descent from them, so meaning Melchizedek, he's not descended from Levi. I mean, he is born well before Levi, generations before. He's a contemporary of Abraham. He received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And so Abraham is the one with the promises. He's the one who was given the promise of the large family, the promise of the land. He's the one with the relationship to God, and he is the one um, who is being blessed by Melchizedek. It is beyond dispute that the inferior uh, is blessed by the superior. So Abraham is being blessed um, by the superior. So Abraham is inferior to Melchizedek. Um, so the point here is that, well, Abraham, like, yeah, he's like one of the most, he's like the most important patriarch. He's the one who was given the original promises where God attaches himself to the people of Israel. And then that's where history changes from then on. And yet Abraham is somehow inferior to this guy. 
Um, and so we're getting a parallel point where I pointed out how, like, um, how is David inferior to this Lord that, that like, in the Old Testament, they, weren't, they wouldn't be sure exactly who that was. They knew it would be the Messiah, but they wouldn't know what his name would be. Likewise, how is Abraham inferior to this guy, Melchizedek? We don't quite know the answer to that, but yet he was. Um, and so, and, and really the only way you can answer that is Christologically. He's a Christological example. Um, and that um, he's inferior because he's taking on this role of king of righteous, king of peace that Jesus takes on for us. Um, and so in that way, Abraham is inferior to him. Uh, so it, it's a real, real interesting example here um, about what this teaches us about the history back then, but also about Jesus. Uh, moving on then. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses, Moses said nothing about priests. This, become, uh, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who had become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life, for his witness of him. Uh, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. It was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one made a priest with an oath by one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they are prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save the uttermost of those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifice daily, first for his own sins and then for those for the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Uh, so to break this down here, um, so he pointed out, like I said, that um, that, that verse 14 there, Jesus is, is descended from Judah, so that's no connection to Moses and the priests. Um, so how is he a priest? Well, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So not concerning bodily descent, um, but in the form of an indestructible life. Uh, so it's, it's pointing out that Jesus, he's going to live forever. We don't know when Melchizedek dies. And so the point kind of is, well, do we know Melchizedek died? Um, so um, we don't know. Um, I even wonder reading this, um, were they even implying that Melchizedek is some form of the pre-incarnate Christ? That's a whole concept we haven't really gotten into yet. Um, but there's there's points um, where we're headed there with um, with Abraham. Um, we had this actually in um, in church this last Sunday that I preached on in Genesis 18, where God appears in human form. Um, and the question is, well, is this the Father or is this Jesus in some kind of pre-incarnate form? Um, and so there's always that question. And, and I, I mean, we talk about God Himself not having a form. So I mean, I take the stance that yes, that's Jesus appearing to Abraham. Um, before he's even born of Mary, he's already there because he's eternal, um, living as a man. Um, so you can even wonder, is Melchizedek himself Jesus? Um, th it's this Hebrews text is not making that claim. Nowhere in scripture does it make that claim. Um, and it's the order in the likeness of Melchizedek. So you get the idea they are separate people. Um, but the author of Hebrews is, come, is writing very strongly here, pointing out how we don't know when Melchizedek dies. And so you get this idea of him even being indestructible, that Jesus, um, he exists onward and forever. Um, so then, um, so the former commandment is set aside because of his weaknesses and uselessness. And on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So let's point out, well, we don't have these Levitical priests anymore. We have a new priest. We have Jesus. Um, and by him, we will be saved. Um, and so this is this new um, this new covenant. And so that verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And so by the law of Moses, no one can be saved because no one can keep it perfectly. Um, but because of what Jesus has done by his death and resurrection, we are saved. He freely gives us his, his body and blood. He freely gives us 
the forgiveness of sins because he offers himself up. And so what, what's wild about that uh, Melchizedek passage um, is he even offers bread and wine. He makes this meal of bread and wine further showing what that better covenant will be in the long future, 2,000 years later with Jesus, um, that, um, that he will offer up his body and his blood. Um, so he also uh, he holds the priesthood permanently. Jesus is there living forever at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Um, and so we need him separated from us sinners, meaning separated from this um, all these uh, Levites, but also from all of us sinners, um, and that he himself is our own high priest, unique after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, so um, without um, father or mother, um, but eternal and holy forever. Um, and then in, in him, we are saved because he offers himself up as sacrifice and he continues on as priest forever, um, uh, offering up intercession to God himself. Um, so uh, th this passage, like you can read this um, and go, oh, that was an odd thing. Abraham gives his tithe to this king and he doesn't really ever show up again. But then like what the New Testament authors do with it by the power of the Holy Spirit, they really just um, hammer home who this guy was and what it means about Jesus, how much Christology there is in these couple of verses here. It's just overwhelming um, all these different examples and prophecies and, and, and things you can just pull details you can pull out of this passage. So uh, when I'm getting, when I made that point earlier about this really talk about redemption, how Abraham has all these themes about redemption, I really meant it because I mean this is very high Christology we're talking here, where it's talking about who Jesus is, what he's done, and all these prophecies about him. And on top of it, <laughs> we're going to move on that into um, chapter 15 here, where we outright hear about how God saves us, how God saved Abraham, how he saves us. So verse 15, chapter 15, verse one. So moving back to the Genesis now. I can just flip on my screen. I can just type in Genesis. And well, and it, I, I typed this up beforehand. So I just press, press forward and back. So I get there real fast. You people at home, I'm sure are flipping through um, real um, hardcover Bibles, but I, I can just click. So I, I just go really fast. So sorry, I'll slow down, but um, I'll go ahead and read chapter 15 here. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. A member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So once again, God comes to him. Um, he, he, God says, I am your I am your sh shield. Your reward shall be very great. But then, and, but Abram says, well, you said that I will have, I'll be this great nation, God. Well, where are my children? My heir is someone in my household, Eliezer of Damascus. And so he's someone um, in his house, so, um, but not a descendant. Um, so he's going to give his, his, his house on to someone else. So this is probably like um, a close friend or advisors, a close, uh, well, a good servant, uh, but not a child. And so his bloodline ends. And because God promised him um, that you're going to have an heir. And so God once again reiterates the promise that man should not be your heir. Your very son shall be your heir. And so then God brings him outside, look towards heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. So shall your offspring be. Uh, so what I, I talked about this uh, last week, but I mean, just thinking about like you look outside and see the stars. I was thinking about the James Webb telescope with that picture. If you've seen that going around the Internet, just just far, far, far out there, 13 billion light years away. You have all these different stars, even really, really far out there. We're looking at a spot in the night sky the size of a speck of sand. Um, and yet there's stars still out there. There's galaxies. We're not even looking at individual stars, we're looking at individual galaxies at that point. And those each contain billions of stars like our Milky Way. And so you wonder, well, like, how literal is God being here? Is he just taught being hyperbolic, being over-exaggerating? Like, yeah, Abraham's got a lot of kids. Because uh, we, um, also being heirs of the promise, like Abraham, we too are sons and daughters of Abraham. Um, I, and not just to mention the nation of Israel. Um, or is he, and he's being literal here, this is going to go on forever and ever and ever because there's just billions and billions and billions, unnumberable, innumerable amounts of people. Um, and then that key verse, verse 6, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So even though he didn't have a son yet, Abraham believed God. And then when he trusted God, he trusted in the promises, God counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham was not perfect, but God gave him that righteousness. God credited it to him as righteousness because Abraham trusted him. 
And God is going to work the same for all people. So we are heirs of the promise along with Abraham. Why? Because we trust in God's promises. What are God's promises for us? Well, they are that Jesus dies and rises for us, for you and for me. Um, that is the promise for us. Um, so we aren't told that we are going to have innumerable offspring like Abraham, but we are told that we will be children of Abraham. Why? Because we also believe in the same God giving the same promises. Uh, that he promises that by Jesus' death and resurrection, our sins are forgiven and we will live forever. And so we hear that in God's word and we trust him. We say, okay. Um, uh, and so and this is a lot different than the law of Moses where we have to work and do it ourselves. Um, instead, um, we, um, we, uh, Jesus does it all for us. He lives the perfect life for us and he dies. And he forgives our sins and rises from the dead, giving us eternal life. We trust in him and he provides that for us. And so this is what I really meant when I, when I said this part about Abraham, it's all about redemption. I mean, this is like you have Christology at the end of chapter 14. And then how does that Christology reach us? Well, it reaches us through God's word, through the promise. I mean, this is right out of, um, I mean, I mean, Luther is using this in not directly, but indirectly in the Augsburg Confession, or it's just in the Langton and the other reformers. Um, but um, when you read through the Lutheran Confessions, you get the Augsburg Confession, which kind of lays out what our faith is, what we believe. And then you get the whole concept of justification by faith. And it talks about Jesus, who we get the person of Jesus in the third part. So that's kind of what we talked about in Melchizedek, who Jesus is. Uh, then you get the fourth part, justification by faith, meaning that we trust in Jesus. We trust in God's promises and he gives it to us as righteousness. How then do we receive those promises? We get the fifth part of the Augsburg Confession, the office of the ministry, pastors, priests, um, through, um, through us, but namely through God's word. God gives the means of grace. He gives the forgiveness of sins. He gives the sacraments. He gives the promises. And so there uh, in church, in the office of the ministry, we find uh, these promises being given to God's people. And so God continues to work through, uh, through people uh, to accomplish um, his promises, to accomplish his will. And so when we hear that Jesus dies and rises for us, um, we, when we trust and that, that word just creates that trust naturally, we are saved. We receive righteousness. We are made righteous. That's what justification means, to be made righteous, to be made right. Uh, and that, and so we're getting all these uh, very, very, very important um, themes here, uh, theological um, uh, points here. This is how salvation works, uh, that Jesus dies and rises, and God promises that to us, and we receive forgiveness and righteousness. Uh, the same way Abraham here, when God made him the promise that uh, you're going to have as many offspring as the stars in the night sky, Abraham believes him. And then he receives that righteousness. Uh, so that is um, uh, that is the promise that is given to Abraham, and that is how we receive righteousness um, by trusting in God's promises. Uh, verse seven, and he said to him, "I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess." But he said, "O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it?" He said to him, "Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon." And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid and laid uh, and laid each over and laid laid half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Uh, so briefly here, I talked about this before. But when you make a covenant, when you make a deal, you take an animal, sacrifice it, cut it in half, and you walk through either half of it. Um, and so God is making a covenant, a treaty with him here. So uh, Abram trusted in God, God counted him as righteousness, and now God was sealing the deal. He was saying, yes, I am um, sealing myself to you. Um, I will be with you. And so that's what's going on here. And so Abram did the first part of the, the covenant where he cuts the animals in half. Uh, verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now I'll bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So Abram is telling him that there's going to be a long process, so that he shouldn't expect the great nation now, that he will have a son at least, um, but his great nation will be later on. Um, and uh, namely, it's going to be 400 years. And so what is that 400 years? Well, the people of Israel are in Egypt for 400 years. So Joseph, when we get to Joseph, he was well-liked in the house of Pharaoh. He was essentially Pharaoh's right-hand man, where he did a lot of the actual 
like legal and logistical work that Pharaoh should have been doing. He did it because he was better at it. Um, so he was really, J Joseph was really blessed by God. And so what happens over 400 years, a Pharaoh comes up who does not remember the people of Israel and then ends up enslaving and mistreating them. And so that's where we get the whole story of Moses and the Exodus. So this is setting up the stage for that already here in Genesis 15. Um, but then he pro God promises that they'll come out of that with the possessions of Egypt and also they will go and inhabit the land. Um, and, but then before that, Abraham will be with his fathers in peace, meaning that Abraham's not going to live to see this day. Um, so, um, so then they're waiting for this to happen. Um, so, um, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation uh, for the iniquity of the, of the Amorites is not yet complete. So the, what that means is that God's working his own way, his own time, um, and that this, all these things will happen later on. And finally, verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed, uh, passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the, Can uh, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Uh, so namely, those are like the same peoples that are in Canaan. So God is promising the land of Canaan. And, and as far as it can stretch from river to river. Um, and so God is giving him that land. And note that Abram does not pass through the middle of that. It is God who passes through the covenant. And so he is saying that this is on me. I will uphold the end of this treaty, not you, Abram. Uh, what, on one hand, a, this is a reminder that we're sinful. We don't do things perfectly. But on the other hand, this is a reminder that God is the one who is the covenant, who does the covenant for us. Like we read in Hebrews 7, Jesus is the guarantor of the better covenant, where it is God doing the covenant, meaning that regardless of how things continue on, God will make sure that Abram um, is the one who has the offspring, who has the mighty nation, who has the land. Um, so God is saying that I will remain with you. Um, that Abram continues to trust in God, and then God will give him what he has promised. And so God is making a very strong binding agreement here, a very strong promise to Abram that he will do what he has said. Um, so um, this is all foreshadowing Jesus, foreshadowing God's promises to us in Christ. Um, the whole Melchizedek thing where he is the high priest um, in the order of Melchizedek. So it's all showing us redemption. Uh, so when I meant that this is talking about the second article of the creed, I really meant it because like this is talking about how we're saved, who Jesus is. Um, and all these things are already evident here in early, early Genesis with Abraham. Even before Isaac is born, um, we're getting all these things. Um, so that is where we'll end today. Um, so um, real real happy note, next week we'll get Sarah and Hagar. So uh, we see that there's some doubt here in God's promises, um, but um, God will continue to remain true to his word. And so that's another point that we make time and time again. God remains true to his word. Um, and But um, ultimately, let's focus on Jesus, how he has died and rose for us. He remains true to his word to us. Uh, that um, that we are forgiven and that we will live forever, all because of what Jesus has done in his death and resurrection. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, yes, thank you for your promises, how you have given us a better covenant, the covenant of your body and your blood on the cross, in the Lord's Supper, in the resurrection. You have given us life everlasting. You have given us your life. Uh, give us your word. Help us to trust. Uh, remind us that um, by your promises, we are saved. Um, that, that when we trust in you, you give us your righteousness. Uh, so thank you for what you have done. Thank you that your, your uh, death on the cross has taken away our sin and your resurrection means we'll live forever. Thank you for what you have done and guide us more as we continue on in Genesis in the coming weeks. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, thank you. It's good going through here. Uh, real, uh, real good passages to read and have a blessed week.